Every year, we as football fans come together to argue about the size of a 20-year-old's hands or arms, the maturity of people we've never even met, and the skill level of some of the best athletes in the whole world. But that's what draft time's all about, baby. Everyone's got hot takes, everyone has opinions, and there's always something to discuss. Big issues and small issues alike. But after spending all of this time arguing about draft prospects, I rarely see anybody come back and revisit these old debates. Sewell versus Chase, Malik Willis in the first round, Patrick Sertan versus JC Horn. Who is going to declare the victors of these debates? Well, that's what I want to do with this series. I want to create a snapshot in time of some of the most heated debates and common stories during the draft season. The position battles, the media narratives, the players held back by an overwhelming flaw, and revisit them later on, maybe even multiple times, so that we as a community can remember what we once fought so valiantly for on Twitter, and to brag when we were right, and to pretend we never said anything wrong. Because we could never be wrong. I'm going to present every issue as objectively as possible, so that later down the line we could revisit all the topics together and see the arguments that were made on both sides. I cannot stress enough that anything I say about the players in this specific video is not my opinion. They are storylines or player concerns I've gathered from research or from what I've heard from my hours of listening to NFL podcasts in all my free time. If you'd like my opinion, you can check out my scouting reports on the channel, and of course, feel free to hold me accountable if I'm wrong. But if one of you says I'm an idiot for repeating some narrative or consensus scouting report, I'm going to reply, watch the intro, followed by a recipe for the Taco Bell cheesy gordita crunch that I saw online, and you'll only have yourself to blame. With that said, We'll go position group by position group, discussing narratives surrounding players in order of their consensus rankings, and I'll end each segment with a list of all the questions I intend to answer when I revisit this video, which you'll be able to pause and read before moving to the next position group. Team-related questions will also be thrown in where appropriate, but let's not waste any more time. Let's talk ball. Although it was once a highly contested debate, the general consensus is that the top quarterback in the 2024 NFL draft class is none other than USC quarterback Caleb Williams, who is considered one of the greatest quarterback prospects of all time alongside names like Elway, Manning, Luck, and Trevor Lawrence. Williams was a highly sought after recruit out of high school and, even before the 2023 college season, was already being talked about as if he had locked up the number one overall pick in the 2024 draft. Many analysts have bestowed the highly sought generational tag on Caleb due to his rare mixture of tools, creativity, and ability to read the full field when he wants to. Williams has the arm talent to make any throw from the field, can deliver the ball without a clean base, on the run and from different arm angles, reminding many of Patrick Mahomes. Like Mahomes, he dazzles outside the pocket with incredible sidearm throws deep downfield, evades defenders in the pocket to buy time for his wide receivers and create space to throw, and has eyes in the back of his head to know where all the players are on the field without even looking at them. But for many, the big question is whether he could play in structure. If you've seen my Caleb video, you know my opinion. But for the purpose of objectively cementing the current narrative, the narrative about Caleb Williams is that he plays far too much hero ball, doesn't take what the defense gives him, and holds onto the ball too long to wait for a bigger play, or because he needs to see the wide receiver open instead of throwing with anticipation. Obviously, these concerns raise the question of whether those flaws will cause him to bust or will hold him back from reaching the lofty Mahomes comparisons, but another question also arises because of the situation everyone believes he's going to. At this point in time, it's considered unrealistic to have a mock draft with any pick except Caleb Williams to the Bears at number one overall, and the Bears just got rid of a young quarterback by the name of Justin Fields, who struggled heavily at times, but proved to be a consistent big play threat with his legs, was a well-liked player in the locker room, and flashed high-level play through the air at times. Ultimately, the concerns with Fields were that he held onto the ball too long, didn't throw with anticipation, tried to play hero ball too often, and that he struggled to process his reads quick enough. Sound familiar? Three of those same weaknesses also apply to the weaknesses the media thinks Caleb Williams has. For this reason, it wasn't long ago that there was a legitimate question as to whether the Bears should stay at number one, draft Caleb Williams, and then trade Fields, or whether they should keep Fields and use the assets that they got in trading away number one to build around Fields. A lot of hot takes flew on this point, and as of the date of this recording, Bears Twitter is still arguing over it, even though the decision has already been made. At this time, we know what they chose. 
After three seasons with the Chicago Bears, Justin Fields was traded to the Pittsburgh Steelers for a conditional 2025 sixth round draft pick. So this raises another question for Caleb Williams. Did the Bears make the right decision in trading away Justin Fields and choosing to take him number one overall? If they do, obviously. If they don't, then it's still a question as to whether they made the right decision in choosing to trade away Justin Fields. And next we get to the quarterback two debate, which has swung back and forth wildly. In the beginning of the college football season, this spot was solidified. Quarterback two was either Caleb Williams or Drake May, just whichever one wasn't at number one. As the season progressed, Jaden Daniels, who wasn't even a consistent mainstay in the top 10 of quarterback rankings going into 2023, shot himself up boards with his Heisman Trophy winning season. Drake May struggled a bit at the back end of the year, causing him to fall out of the quarterback one race for many, leaving May and Jaden Daniels to battle for number two. May is seen as similar to Josh Allen. He has high level arm talent, the ability to make plays out of structure, he's a good enough athlete to evade pressure and pick up some yards on the ground, and he has some experience with NFL level concepts. But he has very inconsistent accuracy due to poor footwork, causing bad misses to open wide receivers, and very poor reckless decision making at times. This gives him bust potential, because if he can't hit open receivers and he can't consistently make good decisions, he might have too low of a floor to make it in this league. In contrast, Daniels is an older quarterback prospect who brings a high floor due to being an elite rusher and having consistent, repeatable footwork and mechanics. But there are questions about his ability to read the full field, particularly over the middle, and further questions about his upside because he has good, not great arm strength, he's a fifth year senior with only one year of high level production in college, and he's an injury risk because he's so skinny, runs a lot, and is very reckless when doing so, causing him to take some ridiculous hits. He also just has a really weird elbow, which drew so much attention that Daniels actually had to clarify that there's nothing wrong with it. Regardless of who it was, May or Daniels were in the top two for just about everyone. And then all hell broke loose. Practically overnight, one player just shot up boards. One day he was a third round pick. The next day, boom, the Vikings were trading into the top five to get him. And it didn't stop there, as all of a sudden this player was getting mocked to the commanders at pick number two, ahead of both May and Daniels. This player is Michigan quarterback J.J. McCarthy. Consensus varies widely on him. Some have him as low as a fifth round pick, and others have him as high as a top five pick. Regardless, it's almost unrealistic to put out a mock draft at this point that doesn't have McCarthy being picked in the top five. And why does consensus vary so widely on him? I honestly don't know. The same strengths and weaknesses seem to exist for both sides, yet he has moved from a day two pick to a top five pick. The difference in opinion really seems to be more how people weigh those strengths and weaknesses and also the ceiling that they project for McCarthy. It's also possible because of that report that came out that said that the NFL is higher on McCarthy than the media is. So perhaps the media went back and a lot of them decided to change their opinion and some of them didn't. I'm not really too sure. It might just be the weighing thing. But that raises the question as to whether that's a smokescreen or the real deal, and whether he'll actually be worth a pick in that range. As for perceived strengths, the narrative is that he has a lot of upside because he has a good arm, throws well into the middle of the field, is a leader with a good head on his shoulders, and a proven winner, shown by his 27-1 record as a college starter and national championship win this most recent season. As for perceived weaknesses, the most common talking point is that McCarthy has a really low sample size of difficult throws because Michigan ran the ball so much and that McCarthy wasn't trusted to lead Michigan, shown by his stat line against Penn State, where he went 7 for 8 for 60 yards, and other games where he barely threw the ball, including the national championship where he went 10 for 18 for 140 yards. Regardless of your opinion on him, he's now found himself in the quarterback two race alongside May and Daniels and is a potential top 10 pick. But before we talk about the tier three quarterbacks, let's talk about some of the other narratives that are not player specific. For starters, let's talk candidates for quarterback trade-ups. It's almost accepted at this point that the Vikings will trade up into the top 10 to select a quarterback. They even recently added more flame to that fire by trading for the number 23 pick, which a lot of people have interpreted as them attempting to get more assets to create a more enticing offer to move up out of pick 11. The Vikings will have to compete with the Denver Broncos, who pick at number 12 and are another popular trade-up candidate because of Sean Payton's history of aggression and the fact that the Broncos are slated to start Jarrett Stidham this year. So this raises the question, will either of those teams trade up for a quarterback? Will an unexpected team trade up for a quarterback? And if so, who will be picked and how will those trades work out? Another interesting debate has been what the Patriots will do at pick number three once the top two quarterbacks are presumably off the board. Going into the year with Jacoby Brissett as their starting quarterback, should they take a potential perennial all-pro in wide receiver Marvin Harrison Jr.? 
who we'll discuss a bit later, or should they take the third best quarterback? As usual, lots of hot takes have flown, and a lot of discussion has been had. The argument for taking a quarterback is that you don't expect to pick in the top five after this, so you should take a swing at a high-level quarterback when you get the chance, especially in a class that is perceived as having a lot of premier talent at the quarterback position. The argument against taking a quarterback is that it makes more sense to build a situation for a quarterback to walk into, rather than drafting a quarterback and setting them up for failure because they won't have anyone to throw to. Which option will they choose, and which side will be right? The last narrative to discuss before moving to our tier 3 quarterbacks is that I'm really curious to see how this quarterback class as a whole will pan out. As discussed, it's viewed as a class with a lot of top end talent. Will this class meet that potential, or will it wind up like the 2021 quarterback class, which had the same hype, but failed miserably to live up to expectations? But now we move to the third tier, where we find Bo Nix, Michael Penix Jr., and Spencer Rattler. Bo Nix is seen as a player with a good floor because he's above average in many areas, but not quite elite in any one area. The concerns with him are that a lot of his production in college was inflated by very easy passes, that he wasn't asked to read the full field, and that he is an older prospect who struggled early in his career before transferring from Auburn to Oregon. The argument against Nix is that a player without any elite tools can't become an elite quarterback, so I'm interested to follow his career and see how that goes. Will the lack of any elite tools really hold him back? Like I said, he's perceived to be above average in a lot of areas, so it's very possible that with a good team around him, he could be an excellent quarterback. Penix Jr. is a polarizing player because he's seen as an elite deep ball thrower with a good arm, but he struggles to throw with anticipation to the middle of the field, doesn't throw particularly well off platform, and was surrounded by Romo Dunze, an award-winning offensive line, and two other likely day two picks. On top of those concerns, there are further concerns about his injury history because he suffered two torn ACLs and had shoulder surgery twice, and other concerns about his ceiling because he's almost 24 years old. Penix really shot up draft boards after an excellent performance against Texas in the college football semifinals, almost leading to a CJ Stroud Georgia game situation, which you can hear about in my draft story Storylines video from last year. There are many saying that if he had lost that game, he would easily be a first round pick. However, we didn't quite get there because Penix went on to win, struggled in the national championship, and essentially put himself right back where he originally started. However, it raises that question of whether he can unlock that high level of play he showed in the Texas game at a consistent rate in the NFL, kind of like how CJ Stroud was the Georgia game CJ Stroud his entire rookie season. The last quarterback in this tier is Spencer Rattler, who was the number one overall prospect in his high school recruiting class, and in many ways was supposed to be what Caleb Williams wound up being, as he was the incumbent starter at Oklahoma at the time Caleb Williams first arrived there. He would struggle, and get replaced by Williams, leading him to transfer to South Carolina. There were concerns about his maturity stemming from his appearance a few years ago on the Netflix documentary QB1, Beyond the Lights, but according to most reports, those concerns don't exist nearly as much now. He's a prospect that a lot of people like because he's a good playmaker with high-level arm talent, but he does fall into this range because he can be slow to process the field, inaccurate, and there are some concerns about whether he truly has become more mature. But it'll be interesting to see if he can recapture the magic that once made him the number one overall prospect coming into college. Lastly, we have our other quarterbacks, which I'll mention quickly in order of the storylines I find most interesting. Starting with Joe Milton, who has an absolute cannon for an arm. Seriously, he has an elite arm. The second he steps on an NFL field, he will have the best arm talent there. But he's so inaccurate, and he practically has nothing else to pair with his arm, except the size to play tight end. At this point in time, we still don't know if he'll stay at quarterback or switch to tight end. Jordan Travis is another interesting name because he was a Heisman candidate leading FSU to the college football playoffs until he sustained a season-ending injury, infamously leading to FSU not making the college football playoffs despite being 13-0. Lastly, Sam Hartman is a name many people are intrigued to follow, so we'll throw it out there as a future question to see what happens with him. So that's the end of our first section, meaning that's the end of all the quarterback narratives. To summarize this section, these are the questions I'd like to answer upon revisiting as it pertains to the 2024 quarterback prospect. Take a moment to pause and read them if you'd like, and then join me to talk about the wide receivers. This year, there are three lead candidates for the wide receiver one spot. Marvin Harrison Jr., Malik Neighbors, and Romo Dunze. Marvin Harrison Jr. is the consensus number one wide receiver and is generally seen to be a shoe-in for the first non-quarterback pick in the draft, regardless of what pick number that winds up being. This is not just because Harrison Jr. is the son of Hall of Famer Marvin Harrison Sr., but because he's just a damn good football player. Harrison has prototypical X wide receiver size at 6'4", but moves like a player who is much smaller in that he has excellent body control and surprising ability to snap off his routes for a big player. He's a polished route runner who plays the game like he's been running routes his entire life, which he probably has, and this helps him to create consistent separation and get open for his quarterback. Because of his size, he's an excellent catch radius 
and he shows the ability to make contested catches, catches in traffic, and difficult catches on the sideline. He also can line up anywhere on the field and win against any type of coverage. The only true knock on his game is just that he's not really a threat to create yards after the catch, but alongside Caleb Williams, he's been given the generational and can't miss prospect labels, requiring us to check back in and see if he can meet those expectations. But recently, there's been a really big push for Malik Neighbors as wide receiver one over Harrison. I don't know who was the first person to do this, but the first person I saw do it was Lance Sirline of NFL.com. He had Neighbors as his number one overall prospect in this entire class since before the NFL Combine. The argument is that for the media, Marvin Harrison Jr. is usually wide receiver one because he has a more diverse skill set and they're not drafting for a particular team. But Neighbors has a more limited skill set, but is better at what he does well, which could cause him to be higher on certain teams' boards. As for his specific skill set, it could be described in one word, explosiveness. He's a super sudden, shifty mover with instant acceleration and deceleration and excellent body control to create separation. He's generally considered to be the best separator in this class, but he also adds the run after catch component that Marvin Harrison Jr. doesn't. Neighbors uses his shiftiness after the catch to consistently create yards that other wide receivers just can't get because they don't have the ability to make defenders miss in space like he does. He's also one of the youngest players in this draft at only 20 years old. He wins at every area of the field, and he can play from the slot or from the outside, although that last point is contested. Although he's a smaller wide receiver who isn't necessarily a high-level contested catch receiver, he's certainly a formidable challenger to the wide receiver one spot in this draft. And even when he isn't somebody's wide receiver one, I often see people say that he would be their wide receiver one in most classes and that he's the best prospect in years if Marvin Harrison Jr. weren't in this class. Is that true? Can he go above Marvin Harrison Jr.? Will he have a more productive career than Marvin Harrison Jr.? Not sure, but I can't wait to find out. But there's another guy in this tier, although it is pretty contested. Some say he's right up there, others say there's a massive tier gap between the first two and him, and this player is Romo Dunze of Washington. Odunze is an elite contested catch receiver with strong hands to bring in the ball outside his frame or through contact. In fact, in 2023, his 75% contested catch rate was third highest, as he went 21 for 28 on his contested catch opportunities. He's a fluid mover with good straight line speed and X wide receiver size, and he's an excellent ball tracker who does his best work at the catch point. Although he's not as often seen in the wide receiver one discussion because he's not as good of a separator as Malik Neighbors or a threat to create yards after the catch, he is often described as being a wide receiver one in most classes, and is often talked about in the discussion with Neighbors and Harrison Jr. But does he belong in that tier? Outside of the top three, the question has been posed as to whether this is the deepest wide receiver class of all time. The record for most first round wide receivers is held by the 2004 NFL draft class with seven wide receivers taken. But outside of our top three wide receivers that we just discussed, there are seven other names that frequently find themselves in the first round of mock drafts. Brian Thomas Jr., A.D. Mitchell, Keon Coleman, Lad McConkie, Xavier Worthy, Troy Franklin, and Xavier Leggett. This means it's possible that 10 of the 32 picks in the first round of this year's drafts could be wide receivers, destroying the previous record. But it's not just first round talent either. PFF has 21 wide receivers ranked in the top 100, NFL.com has 18 wide receivers in the top 100, and NFLMockDraftDatabase.com has 20 wide receivers in the top 100, with 13 going in the first two rounds, which would tie the two round record set by the 2020 draft class. But in that class, only three wide receivers went between 64 and 100, putting 16 in the top 100. And this class is predicted to have 20 in the top 100, giving it the potential to break the two round record if one of the wide receivers predicted to fall just outside the second round makes their way in. It's also cool to note that 26 different wide receivers ran a 1.55 second 10 yard split or lower. With that said, I'm looking forward to see if this class is as deep as we think. But let's talk about the individual players in the second tier, starting with our deep threats, Brian Thomas Jr. Xavier Worthy, and Troy Franklin. Brian Thomas Jr. is the highest ranked because he is the size and strength of an X wide receiver, but the skill set of a deep threat. He has excellent straight line speed to win over the top and pretty crazy body control. However, some pundits really, really don't like Brian Thomas Jr. and have him ridiculously low on their boards because they think that he's a one-trick pony and he could do nothing else except win deep. He's the consensus wide receiver four. Chris Sims has him as wide receiver two ahead of Marvin Harrison Jr. I have him at 16. You have him at, what do you say, eight? Nine. Nine. 
The question for him is whether he can refine his route running to be a more consistent winner in the other areas of the field and whether he can become better at the catch point. Xavier Worthy and Troy Franklin are usually a little bit further down. Xavier Worthy broke the combine record this year with his 4.21 second 40 yard dash and his speed shows on tape as he has the ability to absolutely fly down the field, leaving cornerbacks in the dust. The concerns with him are that he doesn't have the strength to beat press or work through contact in his routes, that he's shorter so he doesn't have as wide of a catch radius, that he's not very good at the catch point and struggles to make catches through contact. Troy Franklin is kind of a mixture of the two as he's taller than Worthy and shorter than Brian Thomas, and he also does his best work winning over the top with his excellent speed and instant acceleration. The concerns with Franklin are that he is way too skinny and struggles heavily to work through contacts during his route, and his hands are very unreliable, as he's not someone who will bring in contested catches, and he'll even drop easy passes, as he had 9 drops in 2023. The biggest question for all three of these prospects is whether they can break the mold of just simply being a deep threat and can prove to be a more well-rounded, consistent contributor in the NFL. A.D. Mitchell is another speedy player, but one who has shown that he can win at all levels of the field. He's such an excellent route runner and mover that his separation ability has been compared to C.D. Lamb. He's also great at the catch point and has very reliable hands to extend outside of his frame and bring the ball in. So he has the potential to be an elite wide receiver when he's playing at his best because he can do anything on the field. But his question is consistency. He frequently takes routes off when he's not the primary target, and he doesn't always show his speed on the field, which has bothered a lot of evaluators. Plus, he's never been a high-end contributor in college, only just recently having his best season of 845 yards with Texas after two seasons with Georgia under 500 receiving yards. So, can he show his brilliance snap in and snap out in the NFL? But speaking of late breakouts, that question is highly amplified for potential first-round pick Xavier Leggett of South Carolina, who I literally cannot find a good chart to show you how far he was off draft boards coming into 2023 because every single chart only starts from October of this year after the college football season already started. Seriously, this guy was so far off draft boards that he appeared in an article titled one player at each position with the best chance to be picked in the 2024 NFL draft emphasis on be picked, not a high pick. And he came in at second at his own position to a different wide receiver on the team. It's no wonder why either. He had played college football for four seasons and had only gained a total of 423 yards. His best season came in 2022 with 18 receptions for 167 yards and two touchdowns. His late breakout is best explained in this thread by Brett Coleman, which does an excellent job of explaining why it took Leggett until his fifth year. As a fifth year senior in 2023, he had a breakout season with 71 receptions for 1,255 yards and seven touchdowns, shooting him up draft boards. People loved that he was 6'3", comparing him to DK Metcalf because of his high-hipped frame and one-cut route running, an excellent catch radius, and elite contested catch skill. And then we learned that he was actually only 6'1", which was kind of shocking, but he still showed all those things on tape, even if he's two inches shorter than expected. So he's still a consensus borderline first rounder, early second rounder. So the biggest question for him is, is this really his real voice? A lot of coaches came and hollered at me before and after this process here, man. Um, a lot of them, man, they, they um, say they got a buzz in their facility for me, man. Okay, I'm kidding. The question is whether his one year of production was a fluke and whether he can continue to be an elite contested catch wide receiver in the NFL. Another really intriguing prospect in this range is Keon Coleman, who is one of those love him or hate him type prospects, and that's because he's very boom or bust. He's not a good route runner, and he practically doesn't create any separation with his routes. He's very unrefined as a route runner because he was primarily a basketball player up until this last year, and the lack of polish in his routes shows. But what he lacks in separation, he makes up for in size and ball skills. He has elite ball tracking ability, and he's an excellent contested catcher, showing the ability to consistently time his jumps to high point the ball at the catch point, and to use positioning to box out defenders. His 6'4 frame gives him an excellent catch radius, and he uses his arms to pluck the ball out of the air, and he's actually a pretty good athlete, as he's the rare 6'4 player who returned punts in college. He further cemented his boom or bust nature at the combine, where he recorded the slowest wide receiver 40-yard dash with a 4.61, but then recorded the fastest speed during the gauntlet drill at 21.36 miles per hour. What it comes down to is whether he can be a consistent separator in the NFL. Some of that will be limited by his size, but he has really high upside if he can become a more polished and controlled route runner. Whether he can hit that upside is the question. And now it's time for our speed round, starting with Malachi Corley, who is constantly given the comparison to Debo Samuel. Can he live up to it? What about Lad McConkey and Ricky Pearsall? 
Will they prove to be the typical white slot receiver defined by their scrappy, blue-collar, hard-working mentality? And of course, bringing their lunch pail to work. Jermaine Burton is a really intriguing player because he's an excellent route runner with explosive movement skills and he's a high-level athlete. He's seen as a guy who doesn't have very many weaknesses, but he's fallen down a lot of draft boards due to serious character concerns. These arose from arguments with fans on Twitter and an incident in which he allegedly hit a woman who stormed the field after Alabama lost to Tennessee. Where will he go? And will he prove to be a more mature player in the NFL? Can Brandon Rice, son of one of the best to ever do it, Jerry Rice, live up to his family name? Is Johnny Wilson, the monstrous 6'7 wide receiver from Florida State, a tight end? Or will he stay at wide receiver in the NFL? Will Devontae Walker fix his drop issues that he showed at the senior ball? Can Luke McCaffrey maybe show some flashes of being similar to his brother in the NFL? Here's also a couple late sleepers that people really like, so let's check them out in the future to see if they break out. Javon Baker, Malik Washington, and Jamari Thrash. That'll end the wide receiver segment. On screen are the questions I'd like to answer upon revisiting as it pertains to the 2024 wide receiver prospects. As before, you can pause and then meet me in the next section for the running backs. All the talk this year is that it's a bad year to need a running back because this is a bad running back class. NFLMockDraftDatabase.com has the first consensus running back at 60 overall, and there's only four in the top 100, which is reflected in all of the individual rankings I've looked at as well, as most analysts seem to have only four or five in their top 100 and generally only have one within their top 50, if any. So, will this class be as bad as they say? For starters, there's no consensus running back one. The closest thing to it is Trey Benson, but he can find himself as far down as running back five on some boards, and the top five in most people's rankings seem to fluctuate drastically. Blake Corum was considered to be one of the top running backs of even the 2023 NFL draft before suffering a season-ending knee injury. Coming back from that injury this most recent season, he just didn't look quite the same, as you can see from the graphic on screen. On 10 more attempts in 2023, Corm had 43 less missed tackles forced and 216 less yards, dropped the full yards off his yards per attempt and yards after contact per attempt, dropped his breakaway percentage by almost 10%, and dropped his elusiveness rating from 97.5 in 2022 to a paltry 27.4 in 2023. So although he would have been considered the running back one going into the year, he doesn't find himself as often at the top of the board. On top of that concern as to whether he can get back to his 2022 form, he's also very undersized at 5'8". But there's another player who took over his number one spot early in the season, who is kind of a similar story, and that's Texas running back Jonathan Brooks, who brings it all. Vision, contact balance, footwork, athleticism to make defenders miss in space, good hands to catch the ball, and solid blocking ability to round out his skill set. But then he too suffered an injury as he tore his ACL during the 2023 college football season, and he's currently recovering. ACL injuries always raise concerns about whether a player can get back to full form, as there's been mixed results recently. For example, Brees Hall had an awesome year off his ACL injury, but J.K. Dobbins and Cam Akers have struggled to stay healthy and have shown just to not be themselves. So the question for Brooks is whether he'll be able to pick up where he left off in the NFL. But honestly, out of the top guys in the class, there's not really many narratives going around. The only narratives that people really seem to discuss is that this is a bad running back class and that Jonathan Brooks is recovering from the injury so he might not be as good and Blake Corum has shown to not be as good since his injury, so there's just not really that many other things to talk about other than some quick hitters, which we'll get to and then move to tight ends. Sione Vaki. Will he play running back, safety, or both? Kamani Vidal. Big sleeper out of Troy that a lot of people like. Will he shine? Can Braylon Allen live up to the Derrick Henry comps, or are they too steep? Former backup to Braylon Allen, Isaac Garendo, was an awesome tester at the Combine, but he's played five seasons in college football, and he was never a full-time starter. Can he show that athleticism in the NFL and be named lead back for the first time in his post-high school career? Can Bucky Irving, Oregon running back who was once high up draft boards, prove that his poor testing was an outlier? Will Frank Gore Jr. live up to his father's name and play in the NFL forever until Frank Gore III is draft eligible? Okay, just like usual, I've got the summary on screen and ready to move on when you are. We're in a rhythm now, people. Any discussion about the tight ends has to start with Brock Bowers, who's been considered a high-level prospect since even last year and would be the number one in most of the recent draft classes. Bowers has rare athleticism for the tight end position, making him a threat to separate anywhere on the field and to outrun the defense after the catch. He's just excellent in every phase. He gets open, he's reliable catching the ball, 
and he's a beast after the catch, shown by his 17 missed tackles forced in 2023, which was the second most for tight ends. Quarterbacks also had a 142.3 passer rating when targeting him, which was fifth best. But he's not just one of those receiving only tight end types either. He's actually an excellent blocker due to his willingness and good technique. So what's the holdup? Well, the first question is where he'll be taken, as the debate rages on about the value of taking a tight end in the top 10, but even the first round in general. But the next question is closely related. If he's picked in the top 10, will he be worth that pick? Also, will he stay at tight end? He's one of these guys that you can say can just kind of line up anywhere. He's pretty undersized for a tight end and may struggle to effectively work as an inline blocker in the NFL, so it's possible that he may be best for a big slot type role, and he has the same versatility as Kyle Pitts, but with a better blocking profile, so he's kind of a fascinating prospect to watch. At the time of this recording, the consensus pick is that he'll go to the Jets at number 10. Outside of Brock Bowers though, there aren't many questions besides a few short ones, so then we'll get to offensive line. The first is whether Jatavian Sanders can prove to be a good NFL player, his excellent movement skills and he's awesome at catching the ball through contact, but he's a poor blocker and not a great route runner. He also tested way worse than expected at the combine. Speaking of testing, can Theo Johnson and Just the Tip Ryman show their RAS scores on the field? Theo Johnson had an insane 9.99 score, ranking as the second best tight end ever in terms of testing. Tip Ryman wasn't far behind with a 9.93. Another interesting player is Eric All, who comes from Iowa, which if you didn't know is tight end university. He's proven to be a good player, but he struggled heavily to stay on the field, playing only 10 games in the last two seasons and suffering two straight season ending injuries. Can he stay healthy? All right, you get the drill now. Pause, read the summary, next position. Come on, we got things to do. And now we get to the big boys. First, let's talk offensive tackle, where OT1 is Joe Alt and has been now for a few months. It's actually surprising how little he's questioned as offensive tackle one. Basically every mock draft at this point has Alt as the first offensive tackle taken off the board, and for good reason. He's absolutely massive at over 6'8", and he moves extremely well for his size, shown by his 5.05 second 40 yard dash time, which is 87th percentile, and a 9.91 RAS score, ranking him at 13th all time. So for the question for him, will he live up to the hype of being consensus offensive tackle one? But let's talk about the next group because there is a big variety. All of these guys are generally seen as being in the same tier, but OT2 can literally be any one name from the following list depending on whose big board you look at. Olu Fashinu, Talis Fuanga, Troy Faltanu, JC Latham, Amarius Mims, or Graham Barton. This is basically the group of tier two offensive tackle prospects in the eyes of the consensus, so let's address each and talk about their individual questions. Remember when I said Joe Alt has been OT1 for a few months? Well, that's because during the college football season and before then, it was always considered to be a two horse race for OT1. Joe Alt versus Olu Fashionu. And yes, it is Fashionu, as confirmed by the YouTube GOAT, shout out Bengal. Before the college football season, many people had Fashionu beating out Alt, but it's recently seen quite the fall down many draft boards to the point where he's most frequently at offensive tackle three or four. Why? The narrative is that he struggles to deal with power rushers because he struggled heavily in his game versus Ohio State. I addressed this in my video, but suffice it to say that consensus doesn't believe in his ability to deal with power. On top of that, he is a very poor run blocker, and the OT1 discussions assumed that he'd take a step up in that area when he just didn't this past season. He doesn't really have the leg drive to move defenders out of gaps, and his hands are the smallest hands for an offensive tackle measured in the combine, hurting his grip strength and ability to sustain block. However, he's an excellent mover and is shown to be a high level pass blocker as he hasn't allowed a single sack on over 700 pass blocking snaps in college. But here's what we'll need for the future. Can he develop as a run blocker? And can he consistently deal with power rushers at the NFL level? Alongside him is an in-season riser who wasn't considered a high-level prospect going into the season, but is now consensus OT2. That player is Talies Fuanga, and he's essentially the opposite of Fashionu in a lot of ways. He's a mauling run blocker with a finishing mentality that bullies defenders to create gaps for his running back. He has the potential to become an elite run blocker, but there are concerns about his pass protection because he only has 16th percentile length, and his lateral quickness makes it a struggle to deal with speed rushers at times. Although he played tackle in college, his lack of length and below average lateral agility have left many to suggest kicking him into guard, which you'll find is a common theme amongst this class as we discuss. But is he a guard or tackle? And can he become a suitable pass blocker? JC Latham is up next, and he's kind of similar to Fuanga in that he's a very powerful player, but he's also way bigger and has way better length. Latham is 6'6", 342 pounds, and has 35th and 1 8th arms, which is in the 84th percentile. His 11 inch hands, which are 97th percentile, give him high level grip strength as he shows the ability to just latch onto defenders and never let go. He has the power and pass pro to anchor down on bull rushes and while run blocking to move defenders out of gaps. And although he's not the best lateral mover, he has good recovery ability to guide defenders around the arc when they beat him to the outside, 
mitigating his lost reps, but he's another one that people want to move into guard. Although he has better length and is a better pass protector than Fuanga, Latham's size makes him a significantly worse mover as he has very heavy feet and struggles to get depth in his pass blocking sets. He's also a pretty narrow fit as he lacks the range to block wide zone, and he's also very penalty prone with 21 penalties in the last two seasons. Again, will he be a tackle or guard? And can he live up to being placed as OT1 on Lance Sterling's board? Although the next player is OT5, his consensus ranking is still 20th overall, so he's no chump. That player is Troy Fatanu, who I like to consider a bit of a mixture of the skill set of Fuanga and Fashionu. Which is also kind of funny because if you mixed Fuanga and Fashionu together, you get Fuashinu, which kind of sounds like Fatanu. I don't know, anyways. His movement ability is high level, as he has no struggles keeping up with edge rushers, and he does an excellent job staying square to them. He's also an excellent run blocker, who's similar to Fuanga, plays with a mean streak to finish his block. He has good length, and he's a little bit shorter, giving him inherent leverage. But his hand usage and pass protection is fairly poor, and his anchor is generally okay, making him a better run blocker than pass protector, because he may struggle a bit with power rushers. Yet again, he's another player who others want to move into guard, and he's considered to have potential 5 position versatility. So, where on the offensive line will he wind up playing, and how will he stack up to the rest of the offensive tackle? Next, we have Amarius Mims, who is one spot behind him at 21 on the consensus board. Mims is the get off the bus type player, as he just looks like a freak of nature. This dude is 6'8 and carries 340 pounds like no other. His 36 and 1 8 arms are 98th percentile, and his over 11 inch hands are 99th percentile. But what's so crazy is not just his size, but his movement ability for his size, as he had an RAS score of 9.50, putting him as the 67th best offensive tackle in terms of testing and size. So he has the size, he has the movement ability, he has excellent hand usage, an accurate powerful strike, and quality play in college, giving up six hurries, zero quarterback hits, and zero sacks in three seasons of college play. So what is wrong with this guy then? Well, he has like no experience. He has only started eight college football games. In his three-year college career, he has 402 pass blocking snaps. Even when he did play in games, there were a lot of times where he'd come out for like one or two drives, then come back in. And there are multiple games that he started in that he didn't finish. This is likely because he struggles to stay healthy, so much so that he even hurt his hamstring running the 40-yard dash. Detractors from Mims point to Mekhi Becton, saying that Mims could potentially wind up like him, another massive tackle with injury risk. Will his lack of experience hurt him? And can he stay healthy? Lastly, we have Graham Barton, who is at number 26 overall in the consensus ranking. Of the tackle to guard converts, he's the one considered to be most likely to move into guard, so much so that he's actually just listed as a guard on the consensus board. This is again because Barton has very poor length. Barton is actually considered to be a player with five position versatility. He started five games at center in 2020, and he's played left tackle since, but he can really fit into any position. He's a pretty high floor player with a versatile skill set, so I'll be curious to see what position he slots in at and where he'll rank amongst the various offensive linemen in this class. Moving to interior offensive line, there's really only one big question, and that's about Jackson Powers Johnson, the consensus number one center who dominated the senior bowl. He's a mauler in the run game and a high level pass blocker from the center position, only allowing one pressure in 2023. He's powerful, but he also shows excellent recovery skills when he loses off the snap. He got a ton of hype after a senior bowl performance and he's a big media guy. A lot of media analysts have him as the number one center, but a recent report came out stating that teams are not really quite as high on him and it's unlikely he'll find himself in the top 25 of the draft. Apparently there are some concerns about his medicals and he's currently nursing a hamstring injury, so it'll be interesting to see if that report was accurate, whether he can stay healthy, and if he'll live up to the hype he garnered at the Senior Bowl. Add him to the list. And now we'll end the offensive line with some quick hitters. Tyler Guyton has rare athleticism for an offensive tackle, which is evident from his tape, but it's more surprising given that he's 6'8". Guyton scored a 9.74 RAS score, putting him at 35th all time. But he's a former defensive end who doesn't know what he's doing yet as a blocker. Can he become more refined and harness his athleticism and size to become a high-level tackle? Jordan Morgan of Arizona. Is he a tackle or guard? You're in a mega I don't know how to say that, of Yale. And Mason McCormick of South Dakota State dominated FCS competition. But can they hang with the big boys in the NFL? Can Kingsley Sua Mataia improve upon poor technique to take advantage of his athleticism? Although Cooper Beebe tested really well at the combine, there are concerns from analysts that he's limited athletically on tape. Can he prove them wrong? Javian Cohen was once a frequent flyer in the top 50 of big boards and has now dropped past 150. Can he capitalize on what was once seen in him? Give yourself a moment to read it over and then we'll switch over to defense. Hurry up. Now, we switch to the other side of the ball, and we'll start with defensive linemen, first turning to edge rushers. The big three of this class are Dallas Turner, Jared Verse, and Leatu Latu. Although boards generally vary, the consensus board has Dallas Turner at number one. Turner is an excellent athlete who works best as a 3-4 outside linebacker due to his speed to beat offensive linemen to their landmarks, 
and his ability to drop into coverage. He showed excellent ability to transition his speed to power to drive back offensive linemen into the pocket. In 2023, he had a 19.6% pass rush win rate, showing that he's a consistent threat as a pass rusher. But he's also a very good run defender, showing the ability to set the edge in college. The concern with Turner is that he's not a particularly refined player. He's just a couple different moves, but he doesn't really have that diverse of a pass rush skill set to keep offensive linemen guessing. That creates problems for Turner when he can't win with his first move because he'll struggle to counter offensive linemen when they get into his chest. Another concern for Turner is his weight, because he weighs 247 pounds, which is in the 10th percentile for edge rushers. This creates concerns with him as a run defender, because it's not known if he'll be able to consistently set the edge in the NFL. He also relied heavily in college on winning with his speed to power move, and it's concerning because we don't really know if he'll be able to consistently win with power like that in the NFL when he only weighs 247 pounds. So that begs the question, can he show the same ability to win with power in the NFL that he did in college, and can he become a more refined player and unlock his elite ceiling as a pass rusher? Alongside Dallas Turner is Jared Verse, who is a pure power rusher. Like Turner, he's not the most refined player ever, and he doesn't have a huge bag of tricks to dive into, but he has overwhelming power in his hands to violently strike offensive linemen and get them off balance, allowing him to use his excellent leg drive to further collapse the pocket. His speed to power move is excellent due to very good burst off the line of scrimmage, and he shows the ability to sometimes win the edge too in order to at least threaten to win inside, through, and outside of the offensive linemen. The concerns with Verse are that he doesn't really have the length you want for someone who primarily wins with power, and as mentioned, he could use a few more moves to counter when the offensive linemen get into his chest, similar to Dallas Turner. Lastly, we get to Leatu Latu, which, if you don't know anything about him, he's the real deal in terms of refinement. He's highly praised by many as one of the most refined pass rushers to come out of the draft, if not the most. Unlike Turner and Verse, he has about a million different moves he can pull out at any time, and he's extremely effective at picking his spots to counter an offensive lineman's punch. Alongside his refinement, it was thought that he'd test poorly, but he actually turns out to be a pretty good athlete, and he has pretty solid bend to threaten a win around the edge too, which, when combined with his quick hands, excellent pass rush skill set, reactionary athleticism, and non-stop leg drive led to a whopping 26.2% pass rush win rate in 2023. However, Latu's 20th percentile arm length will make it difficult to win against NFL level competition, and the narrative surrounding him is that he mostly capitalized by winning a lot against poor offensive tackles and struggled against fellow draft prospects when he played against them. Additionally, Latu has big medical concerns as he had a neck injury taking him out of football for two straight seasons, which eventually led to him medically retiring and ultimately transferring from Washington to UCLA. Can he stay healthy? And can he win against top competition? Let's now move to the other edge rushers outside the top three, starting with Chop Robinson. Chop is seen as having complete boom or bust potential. In terms of strengths, he's an elite athlete with a crazy explosive first step off the line of scrimmage and excellent speed to stress the edge. He can frequently win with athleticism alone because he's just such an excellent athlete in terms of his flexibility, twitch, and speed. However, he's a complete bull in the china shop out there. When I said that Turner and Verse were not particularly refined, I meant that relative to the typical edge one. They both do have a few pass rush moves and will set up tackles and come in with a plan every now and again, but none of that is for Chop right now. He doesn't really use any counters to free himself from blocks, so if he can't win with athleticism and a tackle gets into his chest, he's basically done. He doesn't have great length, leading to him missing with his hands a lot when he tries to establish first contact, and he doesn't come into snaps with a pass rush plan or really vary up his approach in games to set up tackles and to have it pay off later or to counter their approach. This makes him a dangerous pick, but his ability to win with just his athleticism, which will still show up at times in the NFL, makes him a very high reward pick if he can put it all together. But will he? Another fascinating prospect is Austin Booker, who's all the way at 100 on the consensus board, but he's Lance Zerline's edge five, which just shows that people vary pretty widely on him. Zerline's not the only one who's that high on him. Here's how I'd describe him. Put together Turner and Latu, then don't ever let that player play, ever, and then you get Austin Booker. Here's what I mean. Booker, like Latu, has a diverse pass rush skill set to win with spins, cross chops, and other moves. And like Turner, he has great length, the athleticism to threaten the edge, and the speed to power move to threaten to collapse the pocket. He also has very good bend, helping him to flatten to the quarterback and finish his winning reps. But the guy has literally only 254 career pass rushing snaps and wasn't even a starter in college. To his credit, he had nine sacks, two quarterback hits, and 27 hurries on those snaps, but that number is ridiculous for someone who's considered to be a day two prospect. But I'm really fascinated to see where he'll end up and how his lack of experience will affect his transition to the NFL. There are some other 
other guys in this range as well, such as Darius Robinson, Chris Braswell, Marshawn Nealand, Braylon Trice, Brandon Dorless, Jonah Ellis, and Adisa Isaac, but there aren't any really big questions that I've seen anyone raise about any of them, and some of them have smaller questions, but I'll throw that in there in the quick hitter section. But let's quickly turn to interior defensive line. The first round prospects and the contenders for DT1 are Jerzon Johnny Newton of Illinois and Byron Murphy of Texas. Both of them are actually kind of similar prospects in that they're both high level pass rushers. Murphy's shorter and showed to be a bit more versatile as Texas did this hysterical thing where they'd line up Murphy, an undersized defensive tackle, at nose tackle and then play Tavondre Sweat, a 362 pound nose tackle at like 5 tech or something. But Murphy actually showed decent ability to hold up from the nose tackle spot in the run game, and he's an excellent pass rusher as well due to his inherent leverage, strength, and explosiveness. He has knockback power in his hands, and he uses his strength to knock guards into the pocket, but threatens to cross the face of offensive linemen with his quickness as well, often knifing into the backfield while ripping his inside hand up and churning his legs through the tackle to sustain his angle to the quarterback. Johnny Newton is definitely a bit more of a refined rusher, and he's a bit bigger. He's excellent hand usage to win his blocks, bringing a diverse pass rush skill set to counter offensive linemen. Like Murphy, he's explosive and can cross the face of offensive linemen to jump into gaps and knife into the backfield, and he keeps his legs driving forward and his hands moving at all times. He doesn't always show consistent ability to hold his gap in run D, but he makes very flashy plays to get to the backfield for run stops, making him more of a boomer bust run defender than Murphy. Which player will be better, and who will be DT1? One of these guys or someone else? Speaking of someone else, let's talk about Tavondre Sweat. While I was editing this video, Sweat was arrested for DWI in Texas at almost 5 in the morning. He doesn't face any serious jail time, but this obviously raises concerns about his maturity and focus. Before this most recent season, Sweat was a player who was seen as having a lot of potential, but who was a bit too unfocused garnering a reputation as a party animal. However, he had a huge season in 2023, ranking as one of the nation's best interior defensive linemen and also maturing off the field. He had retained his comedian-like lighthearted attitude, but dropped the negative, unfocused allegations, and all of this seemed to really help him. All was going well, and reportedly in team interviews, he showed teams that he was focused and ready to be an NFL player. However, getting a DWI charge only a few weeks before the draft clearly calls that into question. His concerns are further inflated by the issues with his weight at the Senior Bowl where he refused to weigh in, which raised concerns about his ability to maintain a healthy weight and his discipline. In totality, the past history of being unfocused, the implications of not weighing in at the Senior Bowl, and now getting a DWI a few weeks before the draft might lend teams to think he's too undisciplined to take a flyer on. I'm not here to give my opinion, but it is a narrative people are talking about now, so we'll have to check in in the future. So let's now get to our quick hitters for all defensive linemen, interior and edge. What weight will Braylon Trice play at? Trice's playing weight in college was likely around 270 or so, but then he came in at the combine at 245, which is a massive difference. This caused him to fall down boards because he dropped all of that weight and still didn't test particularly well. He was more of a power rusher in college, so presumably he'll gain that weight back and continue to play as a power rusher. I'm curious if the weight thing and the uncertainty that followed it will affect his stock. Brandon Dorless from Oregon is considered a tweener between interior defensive line or edge. Where will he end up? Trajan Jeffcoat. Don't have a question? Just love the name. Marshawn Nealon of Western Michigan dominated low-level competition, but can he hang in the NFL? The UCLA Murphy Twins. Which one will be better? How did Traymond Morris Brash get listed twice in the consensus rankings, and what does the first version of himself do so much better than the second version that they're listed almost 100 spots away from each other? Where will my number one edge prospect, Lubert Denelis of Benedict College, be drafted? Presumably first round based on name alone, so I'm pulling for Lubert. Leonard Taylor III of Miami and Mason Smith of LSU were mainstays in the top 30 or so of big boards coming into 2023, and they've since plummeted. Can they show that they were worth picking higher up in the draft? Can Chris Jenkins live up to his dad's legacy? Braden Fisk had a monster combine, resulting in a 9.92 RAS score, placing him as the 14th best testing defensive tackle of all time. Can he use that athleticism to be a high-level contributor? How about some common sleepers for edge and interior defensive line? How will they do? Christian Boyd of Northern Iowa, Javon Solomon of Troy, and Mo Camara of Colorado State are names that come to mind that I'd like to check back in on. But that's for later. For now, take a look at the summary of what we'll answer in the future, and we'll move to linebackers and safeties, which will be pretty short. We're going to talk about safeties and linebackers together because these two positions are going to be very quick this year. The number one narrative about both of these positions is that they're both considered to be pretty poor classes relative to most years. 
Let's first talk linebackers, as this year has the potential to be the first year that an off-ball linebacker is not taken in the first round since 2011. Now let me qualify that stat real quick, because I looked it up myself. The definition of off-ball linebacker versus edge gets murky sometimes, so I personally went through all the most recent classes, and I'll show on screen now who were the off-ball linebackers taken in the first round in each of the classes. In 2011, Von Miller and Ryan Kerrigan were classified at linebacker, but they're really both more edge rushers, not off-ball linebackers, so we're going with 2011. And after I did all that work, I found a chart from Austin Gale that I'll show you in a second, so that was a big waste of time. But anyways, back to the point, there are only five linebackers considered to be in the top 100 this year, with the first player being Edrin Cooper of Texas A&M, coming in at 42 overall on the consensus board. But it does rotate quite a lot. Cooper is a high-level athlete who needs to develop the instincts for the position, fitting much in the mold of many recent first-round draft picks at the position, such as Zaven Collins, Kenneth Murray, Devin White, Rashawn Evans, and Tremaine Edmonds. However, the NFL has learned that this is not really an archetype that is frequently successful in the NFL, and it's better to pick these types of players in later rounds, leading to players like Trenton Simpson and Drew Sanders going in the third round of the draft last year, and will likely lead to Cooper falling to somewhere in day two of the draft. Next on the consensus big board is Peyton Wilson from NC State, who has spent a lot of time as linebacker one in this class, but as of the date of recording, he is linebacker two. Like Cooper, he's an excellent athlete, but he also has the instincts, making him a day one starter. Well, if that's the case, then why is he the consensus number two linebacker? Injuries. Peyton Wilson has suffered two ACL tears and had shoulder surgery, leading to a five-year college career plagued by injuries. The next player on the consensus board is Junior Colson, who doesn't really have any narratives around him, so we'll skip to the fourth linebacker on the board, who is Jeremiah Trotter Jr., son of former NFL linebacker Ray Lewis. Hysterical, I know. Trotter has the instincts of a player whose father was a four-time pro bowler, but he's the opposite of Edrin Cooper in that he lacks the athleticism and the size to be considered a high-level prospect for the linebacker position. Being much smaller makes it easier for him to get pushed out of gaps and bullied in the run game. His lack of athleticism makes it difficult for him to square out ball carriers in space or stay tight in coverage, and his lack of length makes it hard for him to wrap up on tackles, leading to an absolutely egregious 27 missed tackles over the past two seasons. This led to him dropping from a late first rounder in the beginning of the college football season, all the way from about 80 to 100 on most boards. Still, he has the instincts and discipline to find himself in position on both run and pass plays, so it'll be really interesting to me to compare the trajectory of his career versus Edger and Cooper's. Don't really have much else on linebackers, except that I think Steel Chambers is a Hall of Famer. Haven't watched a single snap of him, but that's gotta be the sickest name ever for a linebacker. Let's move to safeties now, where this is also considered to be a pretty poor class. Tyler Newbin is generally considered to be in the top tier on his own, from what I've seen, and his consensus ranking isn't even until 45. He's seen as an all-around good player due to his athleticism, anticipation, and ball skills. Newbin is actually Minnesota's all-time career leader in interceptions with 13, and he had a 20% forced incompletion rate on throws in his direction. But having only one safety in Tier 1, and not even until the middle of the second round, begs the question, is this safety class going to be as poor as it's made out to be? In the second tier are Javon Bullard, Cameron Kinchins, and Kalen Bullock. Both Kinchins and Bullock were safety one on a lot of people's boards and considered late first to early second round picks coming into the college football season. This is because they are both very good in coverage. Kinchins had 11 interceptions and 10 PBUs in the past two seasons, and Bullock had seven interceptions and 13 PBUs in the last two seasons, alongside a 15.9% forced incompletion rate. However, after everybody got to the tape, they both fell due to similar concerns tackling, and run defense. Each struggles in their own way. For Bullock, it's with strength. He's actually so lightweight that he's a full three inches taller than Kinchins, but weighs 15 pounds less. This makes it difficult for Bullock to play in coverage against tight ends and makes him a non-factor in run support due to being washed out of plays and being unable to complete tackles, shown by his 10 missed tackles in 2023. Kinchins does a little bit better in the strength department, but he's a worse athlete, is much shorter, still pretty lightweight for the position, and struggles heavily to finish his tackles, shown by his 24 missed tackles in the past two seasons. I'm curious to see whether these guys can improve on their struggles and continue to be good pass defenders in the NFL, such that they can show that they shouldn't have fell down draft boards. Otherwise, there really isn't much else to say on the safety position. I'd like to follow up on two pretty popular sleepers, though, in Dadrian Taylor Demerson of Texas Tech and Tyke Smith of Georgia, to see where their careers go. So onto the list they go, and with that, the summary of this section is complete, so feel Feel free to pause and we'll finish with cornerbacks.
This is seen to be a really deep cornerback class, with five cornerbacks projected to be taken in the first round, and all fighting valiantly for the number one spot. Let's go over the players and discuss what are the biggest questions surrounding each of them. The first cornerback on the consensus board is Quinion Mitchell from Toledo, who has a ton of potential due to his excellent athleticism and ball skills. In terms of ball skills, Mitchell is a monster at the catch point, as he has 27 PBUs and six interceptions in the past two seasons. He plays best as a zone corner, sitting back in his zone and using his awesome anticipation to break downhill and then use his instant acceleration to break on any routes and get between the wide receiver and the ball. In 2023, quarterbacks only had a 51.1 passer rating when targeting him, and he had 17 forced incompletions, which was the third most. But he's also one of the best athletes in this class, as his 4.33 40-yard dash was 96th percentile, and his explosiveness, fluid hips, and short area quickness are evident from watching his tape. In terms of his concerns, he practically played all of his snaps in off coverage, as he only played 9% of his snaps in press. Most of these off coverage snaps were in zone as well, so it remains to be seen how versatile he is as a cornerback to play press man and off man coverage. Reportedly, he was tasked with this at the Senior Bowl and showed to be very good at it, which caused him to fly up draft boards. But that's a really small sample size, and it remains a question for him. Additionally, he played at Toledo, which is a lower level of competition, so it remains to be seen how he'll handle the precision and high level of athleticism that NFL competition brings. The next cornerback on the board is Terion Arnold, who is a recent cornerback convert. He's sticky in man coverage and a good athlete with excellent stop-start ability to break on routes in front of him, but he struggles a bit in zone coverage with his assignments, and he's not a particularly refined player due to his lack of experience at cornerback, causing him to find himself out of position a lot. There are concerns about his recovery speed if he gets out of position, but this is debated by people very often. I've literally seen long speed in strength sections and weaknesses sections in different scouting reports for him. It didn't make it any easier when he ran a 4.540 yard dash at the combine, which is definitely not where you want it to be. Regardless, the question is whether he can become a more refined, well-rounded corner and whether his long speed will be a concern in the NFL. Next is Cooper DeJean, where the debate has raged on for months regarding what position he even plays. Some say safety, some say outside cornerback, some say slot cornerback, and others say it doesn't matter, he can do all of them. DeJean has experience playing at all of these positions, and he has experience doing so at a high level. He's a great athlete in a straight line, instinctive to diagnose both rushing and passing plays, and he has good ball skills, shown by his seven career interceptions. Here's the problem, he's white. It's probably late enough in the video that I can say that, right? Well, anyways, people across the globe rejoiced when it was first discovered that there was a white cornerback who may be a high draft pick in the upcoming draft. Mostly because it's a meme, but also because the last white cornerback to consistently start is famously Jason Seahorn, who played with the Giants from 1996 to 2002. Technically, there have been a few other white corners who have played at certain points. Riley Moss played 12 snaps at slot corner, and three on the outside for the Broncos in 2023. And how about Troy Apke? He also played 25 snaps as a slot corner in two seasons combined. So yeah, Jason Seahorn was the last consistent white cornerback to start at a position, and that was over 20 years ago. For that reason, if you suggest he move to safety, people immediately think you're doing it just because he's white, but it's really just because he fits at any position. Overall, the question for him is what position he'll wind up playing, and if he'll be the next Jason Seahorn. By that, I mean, will he be the next guy everybody references as the last white cornerback when the next one inevitably comes out in like 2057 or whatever? Fourth on the consensus board is Nate Wiggins of Clemson, who ran the fastest 40 time this year for any cornerback with a 4.28 second dash time. This comes in at fourth all time for cornerbacks, behind Kalen Barnes, DJ Turner, and Reek Woolen. But he's more than just an athlete, as he's sticky in man coverage, he uses excellent precise footwork to mirror cornerbacks during the route, and he has very fluid hips to stay in phase with wide receivers during route breaks. If he does get out of phase, his elite athleticism helps him to recover. His range in coverage and versatility to play man or zone makes him a fit for any defense and a potential elite cornerback. However, it's never that simple. The talking point with Wiggins has been, and will continue to be, his weight. At 173 pounds, his weight is literally in the first percentile for cornerbacks. This should be reminiscent of last year, where we discussed Emmanuel Forbes, who weighed in at 166 pounds and struggled very heavily during his rookie season in the NFL. Last year, I discussed how there were only six cornerbacks all time who weighed in at under 170 pounds, including the GOAT, Hamp Cheevers. I'm so happy I get to say that guy's name again. 
If we expand that list to 173 pounds or under, we get 15 players since 1999. Not really the greatest looking group of names, unless we're projecting Nate Wiggins' ability to bring a gun to an airport. Now, it would be disingenuous to suggest that Wiggins is anything like Forbes because he's a very different player in a number of ways, but people have stated that they're scarred by vouching for undersized corners because of Forbes and other ones before him, and depending on the success of Wiggins or the lack thereof, he'll either end that narrative or enforce it when the next undersized cornerback comes around. In terms of the last cornerback in Tier 1, we have Jaquincy McKinstry. Never heard of him? Well, what if I were to call him Kool-Aid? Oh, yeah. I haven't done any extensive research on this, but there's a 100% hit rate on cornerbacks who use a food-related nickname as their official playing name, so he's basically projected to be an elite starter. In all seriousness though, Kool-Aid came into the season as the unquestioned number one cornerback and has since dropped all the way to five. Why? Well, for one, teams stopped throwing the ball his way in 2023, leading to the rise of his teammate, Terion Arnold. Second, there are concerns about his overall athleticism. He's very polished and he has excellent technique and press, but he lacks the change of direction ability to consistently stay in phase, and he doesn't have great long speed. The narrative around him is that his lack of athleticism will make it such that he won't be able to be an elite corner, but he's a high floor cornerback prospect, which sounds good at face value, but that's actually shocking. Cornerback is the position with the most volatility in the NFL. There are constantly one-year breakouts, guys who have all pro seasons followed by seasons of just being released or cut, and it's just generally very difficult to sustain success at that position. So I'm very curious about both ends of this question. Can he beat the low ceiling allegations and become an elite corner? If not, will he show he has a high floor as a cornerback to be a consistent starter in the NFL? The next player I want to address is far down draft boards, but once you hear the name, you may know why as he's the biggest faller of this entire draft class. That player is Kalen King. Kalen King was once considered a first rounder coming into the year, and he was in competition with Kool-Aid McKinstry for the cornerback one title. This is because when people put on the tape of Joey Porter Jr. last year, they were enamored by what they saw on the other side of the field because King was dominant that year. King had a 90.1 PFF coverage grade, nine PBUs, two interceptions, zero penalties, a 59.3 passer rating when targeted, and he only allowed 313 yards in coverage on 49 targets. But he took a severe step back this year, to the point where some people are saying that he's not even a draftable prospect. In 2023, King's coverage grade dropped to a 55.7. He only had one pass breakup, he had four penalties, he allowed 61% of his targets to be caught, and quarterbacks had an 82.4 passer rating when targeting him. This was highlighted by a game against Ohio State, where he was absolutely roasted by Marvin Harrison Jr. multiple times, and ended the game giving up seven receptions on eight targets for 102 yards. This game single-handedly dropped his draft stock, as this game happened in October, and you could literally see on this trend chart that he starts to fall down in October. And down and down he went as the season went on, until we hit the Senior Bowl in February, causing his next big drop. In drills, he was an easy win for wide receivers, so much to the point that when wide receivers were given the option of which cornerback they wanted to go up against in drills, they couldn't even pick him because it wasn't a challenge and they wanted to make it look like they were trying to make it hard for themselves. But yet again, at the Combine, he had a chance to bring up his stock, and it caused another huge fall. He ran a 4.61 40-yard dash, which is in the 20th percentile. He had less than 30th percentile arm length. He was undersized, his hands were small, and his broad jump was only 35th percentile. This all rounded up to an RAS score of 6.51, putting him at 788th all-time, and further dropping his draft stock to where we see it today, around 140. But now to some quick hitters, where I only have two. The first is Kamari Lassiter's 40 time, which was a big deal, with wildly differing reports as to what he ran at the pro day. What speed will he show on the field, and will it hinder him? Second are some sleepers I'd like to check back in on that I've heard a lot of people like. Max Melton, Kyrie Jackson, Andrew Phillips, Elijah Jones, Jarvis Brownlee Jr., Renardo Green, and DJ James are all names I've heard that people like a lot, so let's check back in on them. Also, I want it to be noted that I'd love to see TJ Tampa get drafted to Tampa for the memes. Anyways, that's it on the corners. Take a look at the summary, and I'll meet you in the next section. What, you thought we were doing special teams? I am curious what random kicker will be picked in the third round, so I guess we can add that to the list. But otherwise, there really aren't too many narratives going around about special teams players. Instead, it's time to wrap this bad boy up. Don't leave yet. I have some very important things to say. First, I'm going to be making a spreadsheet at some point with the links to all my revisionist history type videos. So when I do these types of videos to track the current narratives, you guys can easily go back to the spreadsheet and see if I followed up with a new video to review those narratives. I intend to make multiple follow-ups for each video as more time passes, 
and I still haven't really quite decided if I want to wait two years after each draft video or one year. So let me know what you guys think about that below. In the spreadsheet will be two separate sections, one for consensus opinions versus reality and another for my own subjective opinions versus reality. So on one side, you'll be able to see kind of the consensus narratives and see how they played out versus reality. And on the other side, you'll be able to see my subjective opinions and how they played out versus reality. I'm not going to put every single scouting report there in terms of subjective opinions, but for things like the jumbo package team last year, where I drafted as if I was the 33rd team in the NFL, I'll put it in there to follow up and see how my team is going. Additionally, as you may notice, last year's video was about 20 minutes, and this video is not done, but I anticipate it being super long. It took way more time, research, and effort than a shorter video like the other one, and I anticipate its length will lead to significantly less views, which I'm okay with because I genuinely enjoyed this. However, I'd really appreciate a like and a subscription as it really helps out the channel, and it tells me whether you guys prefer this type of long form, more in depth content rather than very quick hitting content that takes less effort. Obviously, if you guys don't like it that much, that's a different story, but I'd love to hear what you guys have to say below. Otherwise, this is probably the last video that I'll put out before the draft actually takes place. As for grading the draft, I might put them up on my second channel or maybe here, I haven't really decided yet, but make sure to subscribe over on the second channel so that you don't miss it. It's been a hell of a grind scouting players, writing, researching, and editing these videos and trying to get new videos out every week during draft season when working 50 to 60 hours at my full-time job, but I've got to say, I enjoyed every second of it. I've enjoyed the discussions about each player that we've had in the comments, and I've really enjoyed seeing the community grow. Seriously, I think I had like 40 subscribers when I put out the NFL Draft Storylines video last year, so I'm shocked that this channel has picked up so much steam in such a short period of time. I just wanted to say thank you to everyone, and I really appreciate all the kind comments and support, but of course, please leave any suggestions down below, especially for a more appropriate name for this video. I wanted something to appropriately capture the essence that I'd be reviewing all the storylines and then revisiting them later in time, and I think this more may aptly be titled something like everything to know about the 2024 NFL Draft. But I also skipped over some players who didn't have any interesting narratives, so ultimately I wasn't really sure. If you have any suggestions, I'd love to hear. But I'm rambling now, so let's just end it here and call it a day. Let me know what you guys think below, but for now, that's it. Later.